All right. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to a really unusual and exciting conference on international regulation of emerging military technologies. I'm Michael Scharf, and myself and Jessica Berg are the interim deans of the law school. That's Jessica Berg there, if you just wave. Um, and I want to thank several people before we begin um, and organizations that made this exceptional conference possible. So first of all, the Wolf Family Foundation, which is headed by Jim Wolf. I don't see him here yet, Jim Wolf. He'll come later. Maybe we'll do another shout out to him when he's here. Um, he, every year, he gives the Cox Center the money that allows us to have these really unusual and large uh, international conferences in the fall. And so we're very grateful for his generosity. Also, the Inamori Center and Shannon French is right there. Um, they are partners with us in this, and they've also contributed and helped us make this possible. Um, also, the Cyberspace Law and Policy Center, which is directed by my colleague Ray Koo. Is Ray here? No, you will meet him later in the day, but his generosity is also helping sponsor this conference. Um, also, the Institute for Global Security Law and Policy, which is directed by my colleague Avanon Cover. Where are you now? There you are. Um, and Avi really did a lot of the legwork in communicating and liaising with the, um, all the great speakers that you're going to be seeing. So thank you, Avi, for that. Um, and then Setmons, which is the main organization behind this. And it is now directed by my colleague, Max Melman, who also is the director of our number three ranked uh, health law center. Max, where are you hiding out? There you are. And everybody knows Max, of course, and, and you'll see him more during the day. But I just wanted to thank all of you, especially before we get started. I have an announcement also. Um, after the first two sessions, there's going to be a lunch that is served in room A61 and A62, which is just over there across the hall. Um, another administrative uh, announcement is that often people will ask the AV crew questions about, oh, the room is too hot, can you turn down the heat, and things like that. Um, instead, please direct those to Nancy Pratt and Ray Utrep, the folks who you saw on the way in who are manning the registration table. And many of you know them because they've been around for a long time. They're the ones that make our conferences work so well. Um, the Cox Center has been fortunate to have major fall conferences that really deal with breaking issues and um, path-breaking uh, phenomenon. And so in the last couple of years, we've had conferences on piracy, on torture in the war on terror, on lawfare, on presidential power and foreign affairs. And because of the generosity of the Wolf Family Foundation, we've been able to take our conferences and we have the Journal of International Law, which is represented by the folks in the front row there. And Richard Wannerman there is our editor-in-chief. And we publish the articles and then we have enough money to send these to pretty much all the experts in the field um, and all the professors of international law. And it's really been been one of the things that has put us on the map. And this conference is going to be you know, right up there with the most interesting ones we've had. I'm very excited about it. I can't say that more often, or often enough. OK, so um, we're also webcasting this. And we sometimes get as many as between 500 and 1,000 people watching on webcasts. There's also an overflow room upstairs. So there are an equal number of people probably up watching from there. Um, when you all are doing Q&A, you need to come to the microphone. Microphones, do not shout them from out there because the thousand people around the world um, will not be hearing you and it won't be uh, caught for our um, archive. So be sure to come to the microphones and ask your questions and all the speakers will also be speaking directly into their microphones. Uh, there will be, the, the format of this conference is fairly unusual. Um, we're not doing typical 15 minute or 20 minute presentations followed by Q&A, we're going to do round table discussion. And so that means that this conference is gonna be much more dynamic than many that you've been used to in the past. Um, and there will be Q&A at the end of each of those sessions. And all you moderators, please be very careful about watching the clock to preserve your time for Q&A because the audience is really chomping at the bit to ask questions as well. So the topic of this conference, I'm a sci-fi fan, and, and <laughs> when I just started my career, I was known for um, writing an article about how you could teach international law using Star Trek episodes. But when I grew up, I saw all these movies that, it turns out, are coming true. These are the reality of our day, and that's what this conference is about. So how many of you remember Matthew Broderick in uh, War Games? 
Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, that is essentially our cyber law panel. <laughs> okay. How many of you saw The Terminator with Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, in uh, 1984 or the thousand times it's been on TV since, right? Okay, that's your panel on autonomous weapon systems. Now this one's a little more obscure, but how many of you saw Kurt Russell's movie The Soldier from 1998? He was a biologically enhanced super soldier, right? Well, that's our biologically enhanced uh, soldier panel. Um, and then, how many of you recently saw the American, the Amazing Spider-Man? Some of you, like you guys know what Spider-Man is, okay? <laughs> All right. So Spider-Man, what does he use? Bullets? No, he, he uses webs. He uses non-lethal weapons, right? <laughs> all right, so all this stuff that, that used to be fiction, that we used to just enjoy on TV and in the movies, this is reality now. And the problem is that the law hasn't caught up to it. SETMONS is an organization that is devoted to looking at the ethical and legal issues of emerging technology to get ahead of the curve to tell the world these issues need to be decided. We need to wrestle with these things. We need to have a legal framework for these. We can't just go blindly down the path of technology and not know where we're headed. That's what this conference is all about. Um, I want to also mention that there was sort of a preview of one of our panels. I see Peter Singer there. Uh, it's nice to see you in, in real life. But we were on the radio together with Shannon and others. We did, I, we have a radio show here called Talking Foreign Policy. And we did a segment on the cyber security and cyber law problems. And it was really exciting. And you can see the archives of that if you want. Um, and that will probably, the, that will also be in, uh, um, reduced to writing and published with the Journal of International Law. But, Peter, good to see you here. Um, and then uh, I guess the, the last thing I can do is in my introduction is introduce the moderator, and she will introduce the next panels. So our moderator for our first panel, and we'll just go like that, um, the autonomous robotic weapons panel is Shannon French. Uh, Shannon is somebody that I helped recruit several years ago. She's the director of our Inamori Center. In return, she took me to Kyoto, uh, Japan with her and the president of the university where the Kyoto Prize is presented. Um, and she has been a real force at the university, and she's now also um, has a secondary appointment at our law school. Many of our students take her classes, and she's been involved not just in the radio show we do, but in many of our conferences, and we're real excited to have you moderating, and I turn the floor to you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. <laughs> and I see some of my students here. Woo! <laughs> we have to give them a shout out, right? Um, now, first of all, um, Avi, we have a uh, Skype connection, right? For this one, we yeah, so. yeah, we hope so. Um, <laughs> do we feel that this is working? Do you want me to, do you want me to connect her now? Let's go ahead and connect her now. <laughs> that would make me feel better. Just step out of the way here. I did a presentation not long ago at uh, an international conference, and I brought a colleague on my iPad. <laughs> so I had him like a disembodied second uh, for a, a Zaphod Beeble box for, for the Douglas Adams fans out there. <laughs> ah, success. Outstanding. Hello. Hello. Heather. Hello. <laughs> okay. I think we're good to go. Can you hear us fine? I can. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you great. All right. See, we got this. We got this together. All right. I would like to begin. Um, by, uh, we're going to let our panel get situated here, and I want to introduce our panelists to discuss our topic this morning. Uh, first of all, I want to introduce Neil Davidson. Welcome, Neil. Neil is a science advisor, Arms Unit Legal Division, International Community, uh, sorry, International Committee of the Red Cross, or the ICRC. And uh, he works as a chemical weapons expert and also a non-lethal weapons expert, but we, we stole you onto this panel, <laughs> but, uh, and has served as science advisor for uh, the ICRC arms unit. 
He has also published extensively and spoken on the subject of uh, non-lethal chemical weapons and their use, as well as advising the ICRC on policy regarding these agents. And he has traced the history of the use of non-lethal agents uh, in a paper published by the Department of Peace Studies at the University of Bradford in the UK. And he has acted as a, public, uh, as a policy advisor on diplomatic and security matters for the Royal Society. Thank you for joining us, Neil. Thanks. Uh, next to him, uh, we have another frequent uh, talking foreign policy um, participant, uh, Mike Newton, who is professor of the practice of law at Vanderbilt University, Vanderbilt Law School. Mike Newton is an expert on accountability, transnational justice, and the conduct of hostilities. Uh, he is the author of more than 80 books, articles, and book chapters, and is also the senior editor of Terrorism International Case Law Reporter. At Vanderbilt, he developed and teaches the innovative International Law Practice Lab. And he also currently serves on the Executive Council of the American Society of Law and has previously served on its task force on US policy towards the International Criminal Court. And also on an expert uh, group in support of the task force on genocide prevention. Mike, thank you very much for joining us as well. Next to Mike, we have Greg Noon, who is Senior Program Officer at the Academy for International Conflict Management and Peacebuilding. And uh, Greg is responsible for um, serving as the director of the Fairmont State University National Security and Intelligence Program, and also teaches political science and law. And uh, um, he is also an adjunct professor of law, not only at Roger Williams University School of Law, but right here at our own Case Western School of Law. We're grateful to have him in West Virginia University as well. He teaches international law, genocide in the 20th century, international huma humanitarian law, terrorism, US military law, and legal policies, and has published and presented extensively in these topics, including works on the Rwandan genocide, the international criminal court, military tribunals, and numerous, he appears on numerous forums speaking on these issues. Greg, thank you for joining us. And finally, electronically, and we thank you for your patience in setting this uh, up with us. Let me see if I can make that go away. We're not adding anyone <laughs> there. Uh, we, we have Heather Roth Perkins uh, joining us from the University of Denver. Hi, Heather. <laughs> and. Um, Heather is an expert on international ethics and global ethics, and specifically, and appropriately enough for this conference, law and ethics of emerging military technologies, as well as just war theory, international humanitarian law, and with a, a strong grounding and background in Kant's moral philosophy. She works on issues such as humanitarian intervention, and I had to look at George Lucas when I said that, because I always think of him as the father of uh, the study of humanitarian intervention from the ethics point of view. Ethics of lethal autonomous weapons and cyber warfare. We, we weren't sure what panel to put you on. You could have been on all the entire conference. Uh, global justice and international um, uh, institutions. And uh, she too has published widely on these subjects and she teaches courses at we as well, including in subjects such as security and strategy and on emerging military technologies. So Heather, thank you for joining us. Thank we you. are grateful to have uh, all of you here to address this important topic and we would like to start by allowing each of our panelists to just say a few words about their perspective on this issue. We are going to keep them very strictly <clears throat> to no more than uh, five minutes each. I'm, I'm very tough, seriously. Uh, and, and then we will move on to opening it up to Q&A. I have some questions in my back pocket, but if we have enough from the audience, uh, I will let you drive the train on this. So to begin with, I would like to start our conversation with Neil, if you could give us some opening thoughts. Sure. Thanks very much, Shannon, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me along. Um, I think I'll start perhaps by, seeing as I'm not giving my personal perspectives, rather give it a bit of an introduction to um, where the ICRC uh, is coming from on this issue and what we've been looking at. So for those of you who don't know, the International Committee of the Red Cross is a humanitarian organization uh, which assists and protects victims of armed conflict. Um, and as part of that role um, is upholding and promoting international humanitarian law. Um, and within that, um, 
weapons uh, has been a particular focus uh, over the past years. Uh, now, um, as well as promoting upholding implementation uh, of existing constraints and prohibitions on weapons, um, we also spend a lot of time looking at uh, new developments, new technologies of warfare, uh, to see what the implications might be uh, for, for international humanitarian law, um, bearing in mind that our main mission, really, from, a, from a, our work on weapons issues is the underlying driver, from an IHL perspective, to protect um, civilians from indiscriminate uh, effects of weapons and, and to protect combatants from unnecessary suffering. So, every four years or so, uh, the whole Red Cross movement gets together with the parties to the Geneva Conventions uh, to discuss all manner of issues. Um, and the last meeting of that was in, in 2011. Uh, and the ICRC there presented a report uh, for discussion at the meeting, which was on the challenges of contemporary armed conflict. It covered a wide range of, uh, of problems and issues. Uh, and within that, um, there was a section on new technologies of warfare. Uh, and uh, in particular, a couple of issues that were raised there. One was cyber weapons, uh, and the other one was autonomous weapon systems. Um, since then, the ICRC has been has asked for its views on uh, autonomous weapon systems quite a bit, uh, including by various different countries. Um, and eventually, um, this year, we decided to hold a, an expert meeting where we invited representatives from 21 different states, together with uh, various international experts, to look at the whole dimension of the, the topic, legal, um, e technical, ethical uh, issues around military utility. Um, so this was in March this year. It's actually the first time um, uh, countries have got together informally to, to discuss this issue and preceded um, what happened in May this year, which was the first formal meeting held by the UN Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons uh, in Geneva. So that's just by way of introduction and apologies if I've uh, sort of uh, told you things you already knew. But I think one, I, I will only really make one point uh, to kick off with, because I think we'll get into other things in discussions. And this is something that came through very strongly in Geneva in May, and that is, what are we talking about when we talk about autonomous weapons? There's a, uh, a great difference in the discussion in Geneva between those who think we're talking about technologies far in the future, robots with artificial intelligence comparable to humans, um, and those who uh, think we'd, we're talking about weapons which already exist today, weapons with some level of autonomy uh, that exists today. I think this is a, a, a major sort of uh, thing which needs to be clarified before anything moves forward. From our perspective, we took a broad approach to consider autonomous weapons as a weapon system that is independently selects and attacks targets. So after you activate it, it, it identifies, selects and attacks a target without further human intervention. Um, the way we decided to present this, to distinguish this type of autonomy from other types of autonomy, so you may have autonomy in navigation, flying, takeoff and landing, control of sensors, etc., is to talk about these critical functions, so these critical functions of selecting and attacking targets. So with that, I'll mm -hmm. hand back to Michelle. Perfect. I didn't, I didn't have to <laughs> reprimand you at all. And I appreciate giving the, the context, because not everyone in the room may have known you know, how these meetings had proceeded and some of the core questions. So that was, that was very helpful context. Uh, next, Mike. OK. Um, so actually, this is quite a nice synergy here. We didn't plan this. Um, <laughs> yes, we did. Everything was planned. <laughs> because the, uh, that's right. Uh, because the ICRC you know, is, is framing where the law is and where it needs to go, and doing so in accordance with the established principles. So the debate tends to break down, and this is just an extension of what Neil was saying, the debate tends to break down on sort of the established legal principles, distinction and proportionality and necessity, and how we evolve these, these established principles in the context of the CCW Convention, and then how the law evolves um, in the, in the face of new technology to, to accommodate those principles. And we've all got lots to say on those specifics, uh, and I'm sure there'll be questions on that. But I want to sort of change our thinking just slightly. 
Um, Neil said that, that the core values of the laws and customs of war remain the same, and I think we're, every expert that I know is absolutely committed to those core principles, right? The prevention of unnecessary suffering, the, the, the focus on discrimination and directing attacks solely and always and in all contexts, only against military targets intentionally. Those kinds of basic things are not negotiable. And so the debate tends to get, I think, rather polarized in terms of, on the one hand, we've got the established body of law. We need to sort of freeze technology until we can decide how the technology fits the established body of law, which is, of course, an impossibility. Anybody in the room remember the old turn turnstile kind of phones, <laughs> right? Anybody in the room remember the old kind of telephones where you had to crank the dials? Yeah. yeah. Who would have imagined that the smartphone in your pocket has more power today than, than the desktop computer that your parents had, right? So technology changes, if we know anything, it changes rapidly, dramatically faster than anything we can, we can anticipate. And it changes in uncertain, unpredictable ways, right? So I, I, I want to just turn, it, turn us around a little bit. Um, quoting Oliver Wendell, Holmes, Oliver Wendell Holmes from 1881, The Life of the Law, The Common Law. The life of the law has not been logic, it has been experience. The felt necessities of the time, the prevalent moral and political th theories, intuitions of public policy, have had a good deal more to do with the syllogism in determining the rules by which men should be governed. Here's the key. The law embodies the story of a nation's development, and we would say the, the, the field of law here worldwide, through many centuries. It cannot be dealt with as if it contained only the axiom, axioms and corollaries of a book of mathematics. Amen. <laughs> and I, you know, my, my whole book that just came out on proportionality is exactly that theme. How do we think about the incommensurable values of proportionality? It's not mathematical, but at the same time, it's not impossible, right? We have to think very clearly about what the principles are and how the technology fits those principles. But I think Oliver Wendell Holmes was exactly right in that the, the law, by definition, serves societal values. It serves us, not the other way around. So I think the attempt to sort of squeeze the technology into the legal structure is backwards. What I'd like to do and have us think about doing is look at the world as it is and let us see where autonomous weapon systems or evolving technology can best help us. And I've got a lot of ideas on that. Um, there's a lot of specific ways that we can look out ahead and we can say, ah, in conformity with the established principles of law as we know them, Here's a way that we absolutely can benefit or leverage the use of technology to serve a commonly, commonly accepted common problem, whether it's human shields. There's lots of problems that can, in fact, be constructively addressed uh, potentially through autonomous weapon systems. And therefore, that's the debate we ought to be having, is where do we need technology to solve problems that we now have, whether it's problems of non-state actors, whether it's problems of urban combat, urban warfare against non-state actors. There's a lot of range of real functional, practical problems. And that's the debate I'd like to have. How do we use this technology? Where should we focus it? Rather than being the captives of the technology, where can we focus it? And I've got some ideas, as does Neil. And I'm out of time. But nicely done. Thank you again. Greg. Great. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you to uh, Michael Scharf and Case Western and, and all the great students here that help run these programs. Really appreciate it. It's great having this conference in early September to catch the beautiful weather because uh, Monday is winter. <laughs> so, um, so stand by. Um, last year, we, we had a fantastic panel on, on piracy, which of course made my eight-year-old think that I was the coolest guy ever because I, I was going somewhere to talk about pirates. So this summer, I told him that I was going somewhere to talk about advanced weapon systems, which to an eight-year-old sounds like robot armies. Um, so uh, my, my eight-year-old thought a lot about this all summer, and um, <laughs> we had a lot of great conversations. And, and one of the things that came up with is that, uh, Dad, if we have robot armies, maybe less humans will die. And mm -hmm. overly simplistic in the world of an eight-year-old, but th that's, that's really uh, part of the theme I, I, I want to push forward. Um, I, I was asked today to to try to be a little bit of a contrarian. So these may not be my personal views, but I'm gonna push the envelope anyways. Um, so if, if we can develop this technology, which as Michael correctly states, is going to be tech developed. The, the, the market, the political forces will want the benefit 
of, of advancing technology. Um, you know, Michael mentioned the smartphone, which is really our, our, you know, we're all carrying computers in our pockets and unfortunately some of us don't know how to operate them. But, uh, <laughs> you know, they are advancing beyond what we can possibly imagine. Uh, my wife and I had, had dinner with a couple who were in their 80s the other day and after our conversation we realized that we're both in our late 40s. Um, my 12 year old, he's being called a preteen, so she's now calling us pre-50s. Um, <laughs> oh, and so uh, we realized at the end of our conversation that, that we had more in common technologically with this 85 year old couple than we did with our 25 year old students. And, and the advancements have just been so fast and, and so overwhelming. Um, so really the issue is engineering and how we make these artificial agents into moral agents. How, how we take this, uh, this, this technology and as, as uh, uh, we, we spoke correctly about independently selecting and attacking a target. Uh, how are we going to do that? And I, I would suggest, I, I think we're many, many years away, um, although I appreciate Michael's science fiction, I, I don't think we're in a Terminator scenario, um, unless of course you think I'm from the future and I'm here to convince you the good <laughs> of automated weapon systems. In that case, is there a Sarah Connor? Because <laughs> I'd like to see you later. Oh, um, no. so, um, run, I, we're Sarah, not, run. We're not, we're not in that, we're not in that scenario. What, what, but we are in a scenario where we're going to develop this technology and it's better to be uh, ahead of it and, and developing the law with it instead of coming out and saying, no, stop, we can't do this, absolutely verboten. Um, I, I don't think that's going to be possible and I don't think that's a healthy legal debate. So instead, we should really rather focus on, as Michael says, uh, as of course the ICRC says, we, we all agree and believe in these principles. So where will this technology help us fit in? Are they more useful in a roadblock scenario um, as opposed to you know, an actual fighting army? But, but you understand the point that there are uses out there somewhere. Um, our systems are becoming so automated. They're becoming so automated, even, even if we don't want them to be automated. Everything we do is monitored. Uh, I'm not, I don't have a tinfoil hat. I'm just saying that in your computer, your smartphone, everything's being monitored. We know, we can track, we see everything. We now have not fully automated systems, but we have systems that are providing humans guidance, whether in the medical field, uh, whether we're talking about running a utility grid. And the, and, the, and the automated systems, although not fully automated, they're still open loop, they have a human, those automated systems are operating so fast that the humans can't keep up with it. And so oftentimes they just defer. So instead of getting into a de facto automated system, we should be concerned about creating something that will, will uh, adhere to the rules and, and, and fully move along with that instead of allowing these systems to just de facto make decisions and it's hard to fight the authority of that particular system because we're just going to go because the computer can see more faster, quicker than we can. And so really uh, we need to keep an open channel on this and not simply just say this is bad, we can't do it. And, and I think that's what all of us probably want. Thank you very much. And now Heather. Um, thank you. Thank you for having me. And. Uh, Sorry I couldn't be there. I'm, I double booked myself, actually. I'm at the uh, Oxford Ethics of Law and Armed Conflict oh. workshop uh, right now, so I'm missing a panel to be on a panel. Uh, <laughs> we appreciate that. Um, but uh, I, was, I thought this was a really important panel and workshop that you guys were putting on, so um, I agreed to double book myself and make my life a little crazy. I, I want to say a couple things, um, kind of maybe in response to some of the ideas and concerns that have been raised already by the panelists. Um, I was actually at the Geneva CCW meetings in, um, in May as well. And I think there's wide mm -hmm. consensus amongst the states, um, at least the states that were in the CCW meetings, that um, a fully autonomous weapon that makes decisions, targeting decisions and firing decisions is not um, desirable. In fact, the, the, word, the wording that got phrased um, during these meetings was that any system designed in the now or in the future needs to have what they call meaningful human control. Now, this is a squishy term, right? What does meaningful mean 
um, how much control, right, these types of issues. But meaningful human control really was kind of the rallying point that we all, uh, I think, state parties and non-state parties and NGOs and, and civil society agreed is a, is a very important principle. So um, I'm not actually convinced that a legal ban on lethal autonomous weapons is a bad thing. I think we, if we can preemptively ban lethal autonomous weapons, which has never been done, right? We normally we wait for a weapon to be terrible and then ban it. Um, this seems to me a smart route to go. Um, it, given the fact that the inevitability argument is out there, um, I don't agree with. I don't agree that it's an inevitable um, thing. Uh, technology is a series of decisions made by engineers and a public. And these decisions are highly political and they're not inevitable, which means that they are choice. They're choice-based. Um, so we can choose how technology is used and how we create it. So that's number, uh, I think, number one. So if we, if we agree that meaningful human control is important and we agree that technology isn't inevitable, it's not like you know, gravity, um, then this is, I think, a good starting point. The second thing is, you know, it's not to say that autonomous um, functions are bad. It's just that autonomous killing is not something desirable. Um, there's something, I think, profoundly disrespectful. Um, Rob Sparrow makes an argument that, you know, it's profoundly disrespectful to be um, killed by a machine, or at least that's the the feeling, the, or what Charlie Carpenter calls the ick factor of getting killed by um, a robot. And public opinion is supported in this in the United States, actually, um, through uh, Charlie's work and survey work. I'd also like to say that when it comes to the notion of finding the right places for autonomous machines, um, and not, not, maybe we won't want to call them weapons, or maybe they're just autonomous helpers, um, Sure, if they're not armed, I don't think there's going to be a problem with this. I mean, we can use um, autonomous planes um, for loitering and extensive reconnaissance and things like that, and that would be, I think, beneficial. However, the moment you decide to delegate a killing um, an individual and letting the machine make that determination, it's uh, highly problematic, given the fact that the way in which we create targeting lists and we create, um, that the United States military, so we, so, but the U.S. military has a targeting doctrine um, where it vets and consistently and continually updates who is a target, who is not a target. Uh, they have three lists. I like to call it the stoplight model. Um, there's a red list, there's a red, green, and yellow. Um, so the red is stop, right? You're not allowed to target these, these individuals, um, international humanitarian law, right? You can't say, uh, you can't target uh, non-combatants. You can't target, you know, uh, holy sites, things, things like this. You, know, you can't target any but protected statuses. Red light lists. Green light lists are OK lists, right? They've been vetted through JAG officers. They have, you know, intelligence officers bringing in lists to target you want to do for your military objective. And the, and the yellow light list um, is, you know, questionable. But those three lists and that doctrine itself is undertaken by scores of individuals, um, from human intelligence officers in the field to the commander who's making the strategies and the decisions, um, to judge advocate generals who are making sure that those targets are not impermissible. And so I think the idea that we can create a machine intelligent enough to undertake that process on board is actually a little bit frightening, um, because it takes multiple people of multiple specialties to, to, do, to do this well, and, and we sometimes don't do it very well. Um, so that's, that's I think, um, another kind of limitation. So if, if using these things in the right way and showing that they're going to be helpful, um, I don't think we should have a technological hubris uh, of what they can do. Not to mention, the other argument that also gets bantered about is that we'll just use them in very limited environments, right? Underwater uh, UUVs, right? Um, unmanned underwater systems. Well, that's just, I think, a, a bad argument as well. There are no populated, there, there are no areas that are free of human populations, right? Um, we have roughly a 70,000 to one commercial ship ratio 
to military ship ratio. That means that there's a lot of, um, or sorry, 7,000 to 1, um, if you look at the class of merchant ships. But um, what, what you see is that it's a, it's a false assumption to think that even in underwater environments, even in, in restricted environments, that you would have you know, no problematic outcomes um, is, is incorrect. And so I think we need to be very skeptical and very cautious about thinking that we can, um, that this technology is just going to, it's going to be there, might as well just run with it, and we'll just limit it, and I don't think that is, um, I don't think that's a helpful way to go, so. Okay, I'm, I'm going to stop you there, but that was also very helpful to set up where I wanted to go next, so again, that was all planned, so <laughs> everything is planned, uh, because what I'd like to do before we open it up to broad uh, Q&A, uh, and again, let me remind you, uh, as you heard at the beginning from uh, Dean Scharf, when you do want to engage in the Q&A, you do need to find a microphone because we are um, broadcasting this. But I wanted to just bring out a few points that cut across all of our uh, speakers' summary uh, remarks here and just have these floating around as part of this conversation. One core theme, and the, the reason I said it was nice to have Heather go last there because she brought this out and, and challenged some of the, the previous points as well on this, is whether or not we want to, in a sense, demonize a particular kind of tech or a particular kind of weapon, or if it is always about how the weapon is used. So part of the conversation we need to have here today for this panel is that, to talk about, uh, for example, we know that uh, there are some weapons that we have as a, a human population uh, decided are just appalling. They're appalling weapons to use. And we consider those, like biological weapons, for example, as ones that should not be used under any circumstances. We have other weapons that do appalling things and yet we do not ban them outright. We talk about when and where you can use them and who you can kill them with and how. So where are we going to place these autonomous systems? Are we going to, uh, we're hearing Heather advocate for potentially looking at banning them altogether, not being used anywhere, versus um, we heard uh, some of our other speakers, uh, Mike and Greg, for example, talking about how do we focus this technology? How do we figure out where it ought to be used uh, in a way that makes sense and stays within the principles, uh, the pre-existing and well-established principles of just war that we um, already embrace? So that's one of the tensions that I think we need to look at. Another point along those lines is this level of autonomy. Uh, we just heard Heather talk about meaningful human control, and the point came out also uh, in Neil's remarks and others that you know, these are weapons that are affecting other humans, so to what degree do we want them to be, uh, to have a human still in the loop? Now, of course, we do have other autonomous weapons that are much lower tech than what we're talking about here today. One of the obvious examples is landmines. Uh, you leave them there and they kill people who wander into the landmine area. They essentially select a target in that sense. Um, very low tech, they're not picking out targets uh, in, in a thoughtful way, uh, but that is what they do. They are left, they are autonomous killing systems. So that's not something new under the sun, the idea of having this. So how again do we feel about these weapons in relation to weapons that we already know and have certain conventions and, and thoughts about with that? And uh, I also, I really liked uh, your language, Greg, about this question, how do we make these technological agents into moral agents? It's a great question. <laughs> and, uh, ethicist here, I like that question. Um, do we want to see uh, the, the owner of the moral agency as the weapon? Or do we want to see it as someone programming the weapon? This is, needs to be part of our conversation here as well. So first, uh, would any of you like to follow up on what I was just bringing out uh, before I open it to the floor? Would you like to comment on either the demonizing of a weapon per se, as opposed to how it's used, or on uh, what I actually like to com yeah, complicate that question. Oh, go for it. <laughs> so I'm going to answer it. I just want to complicate it. Oh, we like that. Trouble the waters away. <laughs> yeah, so it's not even in this particular way in which we're talking about the weapon. It's actually a different classification because if we do this, if we create the kind of weapon under discussion, it's it's also a combatant, right? Because we've created an agent that's also a weapon. So now we have a weapon slash combatant in the same thing. Normally combatants have weapons, right? 
So I think that is also something that nobody's really exploring and how that would change and challenge international law and our perception of this as not just a tool, but as a potential agent. Well, and, and let, let me, me let me just, well, go ahead. You go. go well, ahead. I mean, the issue there, though, um, I mean, it's hard to conceive of combatants. We've always talked about combatants as autonomous, moral human actors. That's mm -hmm. what a combatant is by definition. So it's hard to conceive of a weapon system itself as a combatant. But the debate in legal terms then is the shifting of things like command responsibility doctrine. Where does mm -hmm. that lie? You know, is it the computer programmer? Is it the, the person who sends them out? Is it the person who, who provides a logistical support for autonomous weapons? Is it, you know, there's a whole other, and I would say inescapable involvement of human beings. Mm -hmm. So this new technology does, I think, need mean that we, we, we have to reconsider the boundaries of proper combatancy. Um, I'm not sure we can really sort of think about weapons as combatants, but this gets back to something that I think, think you raised, Shannon, and that, that Heather was raising as well, is what's the best type of legal response? Do we have a CCW protocol? You know, and we say, okay, here's some rules. You, you raise the landmines, and there's a good example. There's autonomous technology deemed to be indiscriminate. We create a, an entire protocol a structure for how those weapons are employed. Stopping short of that is what Heather's advocating, which is you simply say, it's impossible to imagine a protocol, a specific legal structure that we could all agree on, so we're better served by, by a prevention. I think that's really the debate. Well, I agree. Would, would, uh, Neil and Greg, would either of you like to weigh in on this, this question of the outright ban versus protocols, for example? Yeah. Sure. Well, Neil, I wouldn't, go for it. I wouldn't, I'd sort of uh, go back a bit um, before getting into whether legal regulation is needed. Um, and I, responding to a couple of things the previous speakers have said, I'd rather look at it, uh, the issue in terms of uh, any new weapons technology needs to be able to comply with the law. And as, as new weapons are being developed at an early stage, this needs to be considered by states that are developing. Um, I think it's sort of slightly strange flipping on its head and saying how could uh, how could the technology sort of improve the law? Mm -hmm. um, but really, I wanted to take a bit of a reality check on technology, because sometimes discussions mm -hmm. can get a bit carried away in terms of the capabilities of different technologies <laughs> um, before we look at what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at autonomous robotic systems in general, and here I talk more broadly than, uh, more broadly than weapon systems, Today, and with foreseeable developments, their, their capabilities are really very limited. Um, they're not capable of complex decision-making uh, by any means. Um, they have very limited ability to perceive their own environment. And they can't operate outside very simple, controlled environments. Uh, they can't adapt to their environment. This is the type of technology we're talking about uh, at the moment, and we should be kind of grounding our discussions in how weapons technology is, is kind of developing off that rather than, rather than science fiction. Um, uh, a civilian roboticist I was talking to gave me an example of an autonomous robotic system that had been designed by some researchers, and this is in a lab, a very controlled environment, uh, and the, the idea of this robot was to make pancakes <laughs> autonomously. Uh, so it's there, it has all the kind of mixing bowls, the ingredients, and so on. Um, and it's overseen by the, uh, by the researchers, all the environment's controlled. Um, if anything goes wrong, they can intervene. This robot manages to make pancakes 50% of the time. <laughs> so there we see um, the type of technology we're talking about. So, um, you know, you could imagine weapon systems... Uh, developed with today's technology that operate autonomously, that is, they independently select and attack their targets, uh, that cause uh, significant problems <laughs> legally and ethically. Going back to linking to what Heather said, I think something that did come through strongly in Geneva and elsewhere is that no one's, I mean, to put it one way, um, everyone is in agreement that there needs to be a certain level of human control over the use of weapons and the use of force. To be out of control would be unlawful, be unethical. Uh, and the question is, where does, that, uh, where does that kind of barrier or line lie? lie? And I think there we need a lot more uh, detailed look at how weapons technology is developing today, how existing weapons with some autonomy in their selecting and attacking targets, how they're considered, how human control is considered in, uh, uh, maintained over those weapons. Because as 
technology develops, as, uh, let's say, more freedom is given to a weapon system, um, it's clear that the concerns, both from a legal perspective uh, and other perspectives, will, will increase. Greg, I think you yeah, wanted yeah, to weigh so, in here. So, so I, you know, I don't disagree with Neil in, in any way. I mean, the, the technology that we have right now is really nowhere close to what we're talking about. I mean, uh, um, whether we're talking about service robots for care for the elderly or the sick, I mean, those are all very limited. They're going to they're gonna give prescription drugs at the right amount of time each day. Um, but they can be stopped by a broom that falls down between the kitchen and the living room, and, and, the, and that robot's not going to be able to go forward. Uh, so whether we're talking about the, 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 the Roomba vacuum cleaner or... Um, you know, uh, any other technology like that. We're, we're not even close to it. Um, but, you know, South Korean government d did say that they want a robot maybe home by 2020. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, you have some, have some uh, ideas there. And then, of course, in the financial systems, you have, you have computers making millions of decisions to approve or reject trades every minute. Um, not, not, not every hour, but every minute they're making millions of decisions. So, so these are basic code uh, systems that can be developed, and, and so we're really not, um, we're not at that level. Um, so, so aside from flashing forward to 2029, which I hope they replay this in 2029, which is the year of the Terminator, um, <laughs> and, or maybe 2045, which is, I believe, the Matrix year. There you uh, go. So, so I don't think we're going to get there in 2029. Yeah. But I, I guess one of my biggest concerns is that we're using systems more and more to assist and guide. And so, yes, they're not fully automated weapon systems, but we have operators, operating systems that are, um, whether we're talking about in a cockpit or whether we're talking about in a joystick, or and, and they're getting more and more information, and the computer technology is advancing, and yes, there's still a human in control, but it goes to Heather's point, is it meaningful control? Is, is at some point the human... Uh, it, it, as I said earlier, incapable of monitoring the entire system mm -hmm. so that they simply kind of de facto turn it over to target selected and press the button. Mm -hmm. So yes, you still had a human in the system, but it becomes a de facto closed loop system. And the human is so essentially a deformation bias actually is what the, mm -hmm. yeah. No, go ahead, Heather. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, that's, I mean, to, to the point, it's, it's referred to as automation bias and it's a, it's a, it's a serious worry, right? We do have studies of um, of automation bias happening in military um, in military circles, you know, tank operators, for example. Uh, one of my students is a, was was my, one of my students uh, at Corbell was a uh, a colonel in a tank command, and you know he basically said that the software that we use currently um, for some of our our tanks um, cues targets, right? It, cues, it lines them up, it cues them, and says, okay, these are good good guys, these are bad guys. Sometimes those things um, were incorrect, but it took a human being to say, "Oh, that is—that's not right. Um, that's that actually—that can't be a bad tank. That that this position is, is is behind my line." So, um, but the the automation bias worry is there that you just kind of continually hit a button without looking or thinking or questioning the technology because we also right we also start to to trust the technology. Um, we trust that, well, for the most part, you know, it gets me there. But occasionally, right, think of your GPS or your Siri. Occasionally, they give you some really bizarre answers or some bizarre directions. You think, that's not right. Um, and I worry that um, this kind of continual acceptance, it's going to be like, it's going to like jump, instead of jumping into a, a cold pool, we get in one toe at a time. Yeah. Um, we say, ah, that's pretty good. The boiled yeah. frog so, problem, right? And then it's the slippery <laughs> slope all the way down, right? Well, and I, I think Greg wants to jump in again. Yeah, Go so, ahead. So, so in, in, in Heather, that, that's exactly right. Uh, uh, better articulated than I did. Um, and, and so I guess to, to fight off this automation bias, mm -hmm. the question is, would it be better to have an automated system? Uh, you know, so so if you if you truly uh, you know had had a had a system with built-in ethical constraints that understood the rules and uh, of course thoroughly tested and of course we're talking years in the future, but is that better? Is a thoroughly tested automated system better than this creeping and advancing automation automation bias? Do I have it right, Heather? Mm -hmm. Automation bias. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so, so is that creep? Is the automation bias creeping so far along that that's getting out of control 
that perhaps an automated system would be better. Can I extend that thought just yeah, a little bit? Yeah, go ahead, bit? Mike. And I, and I know Heather wants to jump in here so she, <laughs> so she can respond to both. Um, but hold, let me push, hold your fire, Heather. <laughs> let me push that just a little bit. Um, and this is from the perspective, um, you know, Shannon knows this. I was a combat arms guy and an operational lawyer and have done this mm -hmm. in the real world. And the idea that humans are always more... Um, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a potential human bias here as well, <laughs> right? The idea that in the fog of battle and in the heat of changing technology and misinformation that, you know, we've got to have the human in the system mm -hmm. to make those snap evaluations. I mean, I've personally seen situations where we've seen something, we've changed ROE, we've desperately tried to get a hold of units in the field, when that can all happen instantaneously technology, mm -hmm. technology-wise you know, uh, and across the entire force. So if you're successful, if you happen to have the right person in the right place to make the right decision, great. And that's why we do training, and that's what the ICRC is all about, is trying to, to disseminate uh, the knowledge of the rules. But there's equally the, 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 I think, salutary consequence that you can simply say in the programming structure, and it's instantaneous, it's communicated across the force, and even more importantly, and this is vital in, in modern sort of combined operations, um, we, we eliminate language barriers. I can, I can say exactly the same thing instantaneously about targeting choices, about shifting proportionality analysis, about shifting intelligence, and it goes into, in a multinational context, mm -hmm. every weapon system out there instantaneously. There have to be situations where that's a desirable outcome rather than saying, oh, well, you know, we'll get to the Russians when we can get to them. You know, I, I'm interested. I wasn't at the Geneva meeting, so I'm curious for both of you who were there uh, to comment on this, this idea of meaningful human control. Was that based in uh, what, what Mike is sort of referring to as the human bias that essentially we do trust humans to make more ethical decisions or to respond more appropriately to changing situations on the ground than we would trust automated. Is, is that at the core of this or is it more Rob Sparrow's point that whether the human makes the better decision or not, it is still fundamentally important that the decision be made by a human and, and maybe that's not an either or. But I'd like to hear from Heather and Neil on that. Heather, go ahead and then and then Neil. Um, well, I think the, the meaningful human control issue, right, is that we are going to have systems that are highly automated. We already have highly automated systems. Most of our intelligence comes through automated, um, you know, it spits out intelligence reports from all variety of, 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 um, of sources. But I think what we need to think about here, right, is so the DOD issued, you know, its, its autonomy report, you know, task force report, and it's in it, I think it's quite telling the way in which at least the, you know, the United States is viewing um, its desirability of having more and more autonomous systems. And they call, in the DOD report, uh, they refer to them as taskable agents. They say, look, sometimes what we need to do is we just need to like, send something out. It's not going to be in communications. It's not going to, you know, it's, we're going to send it out and it's going to come back. And hey, hopefully, hopefully everything went OK. Um, and that, to me, is just a bit bizarre, right? I mean, why would you want a taskable weapon that goes out, comes back, and you're out of comms with it? I don't know one commander that would sign off on this and say, oh yeah, and by the way, you can hold me responsible for anything that that thing does <laughs> when I don't know what it's doing. I mean, because command responsibility, right, presupposes effective control. Although I, it could be argued that uh, you, you don't have that level of control with humans either, no, which no, could be right. part of it. I, I, yeah. ju I just said to Mike, it's called yep. Lance Corporal. <laughs> uh, you know, so, uh, and not to disparage Lance Corporals, but yeah. th there, are, there are some guys that when you send them out, you, you lose comms with them, you lose control with them, and, and this is where, as Mike said, and, uh, and of course, uh, you know, Neil is uh, fully invested in this, in the training of this, right? So, so you train and train and train to hope that they do the right thing when the time comes. But that's the, that's the exception, right? What we're talking about is creating a non-comms, a non-communication norm. Not the exception. Not like, oh, there was a PFC. He lost communications. Hope he's doing okay. But I, but I don't think I don't think we're talking about creating a non-communication norm. I, I think, in fact, to Mike's point is that we'd have better communication. 
because mm -hmm. you, you faster you're faster and, 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 and you know immediate uh, communication uh, but but I, I want to seize on what you said Heather uh, uh, excuse me uh, Shannon mm -hmm. um, it, it, I, if I got it right is faulty human control better than autonomous system right right because we do have human error right um, and and you know on the battlefield of course we have human error and in life we have human error um, you know I read uh, recently that there are 100 to 200 deaths every day from medical errors in the United States mm -hmm. so every couple of months we have a 9-11 in our hospitals mm -hmm. so there's plenty of human error out there uh, in 1990 uh, the uh, there was a steam fire on the USS Iwo Jima that killed uh, uh, killed a dozen men because somebody screwed the fastening bolt used a brass bolt instead of a steel bolt Ugh. and so when the when the system when the boilers went off the, the steam valve blew and you had uh, uh, just untold heat blasting in and, and, and killing these individuals and we all have scenarios like that so whether you're talking about airplane crashes car crash you know police shootings mm -hmm. Um, you know, but certainly in the battlefield, friendly fire. Mm. And so you're, you're going to have human error. So it really comes back to, is it better to have a system that can remove the human error, or are we good with the amount of human error that is going to happen? And then beyond the error, uh, you know, as, as Professor Arkin writes about his, his uh, the, the work that he talks about with respect to what gets individuals on the battlefield closer to committing war crime. And he goes through his analysis of, of all the different factors that, that go into that. And yeah, Ron uh, Arkin would accuse me of having a human's bias because he and I argue <laughs> about and, 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 and so I'm sure you could better address uh, you know, Ron Arkin's argument than I can, but, it, but it's an interesting one nonetheless that, that he puts forward. And I know there's a lot of pushback on his argument. So um, I, I but even the assumption that we have these machines that you know, are, they're not going to get ruffled. I think one, one, one expert in Geneva said, oh, here's a benefit, robots won't rape. Um, I mean, this is just kind of bizarre to me because while we are talking about, um, sure, they're not going to be um, thinking about revenge, but the other thing, the flip side of this coin is that human beings also have empathy and they have sympathy. And you have combatants that emulate these types of virtues. And so if you're removing all emotion, you're removing good emotion, too. Right? Do we want to remove that from an already bleak battlefield? Well, and I, I know I, I promised I would let Neil speak, but I, I did want to just briefly comment. When I used to work at the Naval Academy with, with George and others, um, we had uh, uh, a colleague who there, uh, Bob Perano, who was a pilot, and he said the best commander he ever had used to tell him, uh, tell all of them when he was briefing them for a mission, at the very end he would say, okay, so here's your mission parameters, here's what you're supposed to do, unless it doesn't look right. And you know, adding that human element very intentionally into the conversation, I just it, I was reminded of that with some of the, the comments. Neil, sorry to have made you wait there. No problem. Um, yeah, I think really, you know, brings back to two core questions. One is the legal question, one is the ethical question. Mm -hmm. um, and we're looking at compliance with IHL. We need to look at the weapon technology and the way it's intended to be used, and we need to see whether. If we're going to let a weapon system independently select and attack targets, we have to see whether it can com comply with IHL in the situations that tended to be used. Um, and if we look at current and foreseeable technology, uh, it's really hard to, it's, it's kind of speculative to imagine that the types of human judgments uh, needed to uh, apply IHL independently could be programmed into a machine. Look at basic distinction between civilians, combatants, someone who's wounded, someone who's surrendering. Um, look at uh, whether a system can judge to take precautions in attack. Look at wider proportionality uh, assessments, which become even more difficult if a system's operating over a long period of time. Look at if you give, I mean, we need to look, again, placing this in the context of how weapons technology is developing, we're seeing more and more robotic weapon systems uh, in the air, on the ground, in the sea. Um, for the moment, uh, the targeting and firing is, is by remote control. If we see more of those systems, and these systems can have more autonomy in terms of the, the, the situations in which they operate, the, the, um, the scope of their action over time, um, it's really going to be less, not more, less predictable, not more predictable in terms of how they operate and how uh, it's judged whether they comply with, with IHL. So, 
from a legal perspective, I think at the moment there are serious doubts about whether autonomous weapon systems can comply with IHL in all but the narrowest of scenarios uh, and the simplest of environments. Um, so that's what I'd say on, on the law. On the ethics, and I think this really is um, uh, something which needs much more discussion among states uh, and you know, meetings like this, because um, it's really a question that goes way beyond this panel and uh, people in the room today. It's really a question for everyone. And that is uh, a certain point where we effectively may delegate uh, the use of force to machines. Um, is that something we want to do? Is that something that's ethically acceptable, that's morally acceptable, that's socially acceptable? Uh, that's a difficult question. I think um, it's something we all have to ask ourselves and we have to think about a lot more. I think we can make some initial points, uh, especially around this discussion, Heather raised it, the question of whether a machine can be more ethical than a human or as ethical. I mean, it's, to me, it's a misnomer. Mm -hmm. um, a machine has programming. It can't have ethics. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, many ethicists would argue that uh, hu human, uh, human ethical and moral reasoning is, you know, <coughs> is, is human emotions and, and thoughts are, are sort of central to being able to make these kind of judgments. Um, and linked to that, um, I think it's always risky with any weapon technology. Remember, a weapon technology is designed to cause harm, essentially. Um, it's, uh, that's important to remember. So it's, danger to, it's always dangerous to think of a weapon technology in terms of so-called sort of humanitarian benefits. I think we need to consider what the weapon technology does, what its likely use is. So how may it be used? How, how is it most likely to be used? Uh, and obviously, with, some, with a weapon system that acts independently to use force, uh, to kill, um, obviously you can see potential risks in how that might be used, um, especially looking at the various conflicts we have going on today uh, and where we see uh, misuse of many types of weapons in, in contravention of IHL. I think uh, Greg and Mike wanted to jump in here. I just wanted to make one other quick point on the analogy I drew earlier on landmines, and that is perhaps also in the mix here, we might ask the question, if you're going to be on the receiving end, uh, is some of the technology that we're talking about a vast improvement nevertheless over, for example, the landmine? So if you were saying, you know, yes, maybe I'd rather have a human deciding whether or not to kill me, I would prefer an advanced robot that might recognize me trying to surrender, for example, versus a landmine that really has no discernment at all. But yeah, go ahead. I, I just want to clean something up and then I'll turn it over to Mike. And, and that is, I, I, perhaps I didn't state it, but we're operating under the assumption that whatever is developed would comply with IHL. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I take Neil's point uh, very seriously, obviously, that mm -hmm. we're, we're not talking about things that we'd send out there that wouldn't comply with IHL. So it would have to go through the legal uh, or, um, uh, uh, scrub to make sure that we're in compliance. So I, I'm on, we're all on the same page on that one. Now, mm -hmm. how do you get there is a different story. But, <laughs> but, but, but uh, that's the assumption that at least I'm operating off of, and I think mine is. Just a very quick response to that. I yeah. think you know, I, I recognize that assumption. I, I saw it in Geneva as well during the legal discussion. I think it's a risky assumption mm. uh, because you can't divorce the legal analysis from the technological assessment. We have to look at how weapons technology is. This isn't a theoretical discussion, in a sense. Odd we, implies we have, can. Have, <laughs> sorry? Odd implies can. actually yeah. have a little bit of understanding of what artificial intelligence and how they're programming this, right? So, I mean, if you're looking at this, there's several different ways in which you can create a learning machine. Um, all of them are going to give you a different set of problems, though, right? So you have top-down approaches, which are these, like, coding line approaches. But these are very brittle systems. And if, it, if it's a brittle system that kind of doesn't understand what to do because you didn't figure out the one rule to program into it when you're on a complex battlefield, it's not going to be operationally useful. So top-down systems are restricted. Bottom-up systems are more like how a child learns, you know, through interaction in different times of, uh, of, of things like this. But in those systems, I think I think Peter Singer is there. Um, you know, in his, for example, Peter talks about it. I think in his book, you can get bad robots. Um, you can get bad behavior from these these types of systems. And now we have systems of neural networks of this like human robot interaction, caregiving thing. It's very bizarre. Uh, but I, I think the way in which we're creating the the machine to be a reason a reasoning machine. Um, all have different sets of problems that if you take those and you put them into a battlefield context, which is a very complex environment, it's very cluttered, you know, just sense and avoid technology is not going to do it. 
I think we have to think about, you know, the, the, the reality that this technology would be necessarily in, unpredictable because of the way in which the technology functions. Mike, I've, I've been making you wait, so I'm going to let you speak. And then uh, those of you in the audience, in just a moment, I'm going to open up to your questions. So please be formulating your questions. Go ahead, Mike. Well, I thought, I thought Neil was rather brilliant to bring it right back where I started, <laughs> which was to say, you know, I think it's an overstatement slightly, and I don't think Neil was saying this, that in all contexts, it's inherently illegal or unethical. Mm -hmm. I mean, the real question is, how do we shape the technology and how do we make conscious plans, whether it's in treaty basis or protocol or simply by mutual agreement? Or there's any, I think, and this is where I started, I think we should turn it around. I mean, imagine what are the most difficult problems in international humanitarian law today. It's not distinction. We all agree on that. You know, it's not, there's any, any number of other things that we absolutely agree on, both as a legal and as an ethical matter. The problems that we really wrestle with is how do we constrain the behavior of non-state actors, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, I could easily imagine, and this is just me hyp hypothesizing, but I'd like to see some real technological development that says, okay, we've got an autonomous weapon system with biometrics and a biometric signature that's able to track down Joseph Coney or a known combatant. And we're able to send that out there, swarms of these suckers, and go find Joseph Coney in the woods, assuming he's a lawful combatant. Mm -hmm. You know, we meet all those basic legal criteria. I have no problem saying, you know, let's stop the, the illegality. And if, you know, we all, and I come at these things many times from the international criminal justice perspective, you know, we talk about the necessity for justice and deterrence and how criminal trials deter. Well, there's a whole lot more deterrence for Joseph Coney in the jungle or some other non-state actor to know, you know what, I'm personally on the hook here, right? And, and in, in my book on proportionality, I put the letter that General Sherman wrote back to the citizens of Atlanta, right? They write and they say, please don't destroy our city. And his letter is just a work of art. He says, you basically, you kind of started this, right? <laughs> and I want to say that to the non-state actors out there that are committing the rapes and the mass war crimes. You know, right now, we're structurally defective in the way we can really get at enforcing the laws and customs of war against those non-state actors. Mm -hmm. That's one way that I think potentially autonomous weapon systems help us, both ethically and, and legally and morally. And so, there's a lot of other ways. So my, all I'm saying is I don't think we should necessarily foreclose the debate. We've got to do it the other way around and say what really potential valuable functions could be served here that reinforce the law, that do reinforce fundamental human rights. And let's see if it's possible to get to a way using the technology that does advance those core goals. And if not, fine, at the end of the day. But right now, we've got this sort of core set of almost insoluble problems and I'm not consent, content just to say, well, here's this core set of insoluble problems, even as technology rapidly changes, and we're just going to sort of ignore them. No, I'd like to make some progress on those kind of problems. You want to see if the technology can solve any of those. Absolutely. And, and if, it, if it is, you don't want it pre-demonized, as I was using the, the term early. There Absolutely. might be something that it can do. Um, Heather, you look like you were bursting to make. Did you want to make one last little comment before well, I open it to I the floor? <laughs> I think there's, a, there's an assumption in that argument that technology will always do the right thing and that it's, that technology is going to save us. And I don't think that's... Technological that's optimism? Yeah. Uh, Neil, go ahead. Just, just very quickly on that. Um, it again, it comes back to my point about how technology might be used. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, sort of also linking um, to Mike's comments about uh, distinction. We do have a problem of distinction in many conflicts that are ongoing today. I mean, look at Syria. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for example, and um, we have to think about how uh, future weapons technologies may be used and misused as well, and the risks associated with that. All right. Uh, now, at this time, I would like to take questions from our audience. Please do come to a mic. Uh, you, you're first. You, you, you uh, buy a hair. <laughs> okay. Oh, you're just moderating. Okay. <laughs> Peter. Oh, perfect. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Well, first, thanks to the panel. Really fascinating discussion. Um, one that I obviously love near and dear to my heart. I wanted to introduce sort of three factors that haven't been talked about yet and get your view on how you see them shaping this debate that you've had and, and we'll all be having in the years and decades ahead. And there's sort of three things that we know. 
um, about this space. The first is that we know this is a technology that while the US has led in it, and so there's this kind of assumption baked in that we've been using phrases like us in the discussion today, the reality is not only has it already proliferated in some domains, um, in AIR we've got uh, at least 87 different states and a variety of non-state actors that have used drones already, but more so in other domains, we're seeing nations other than the US take the lead potentially. Um, I run an article series for Popular Science magazine that looks at Chinese military technology called Eastern Arsenal. And today, for example, we broke the story of a Chinese version of the famous big dog ground robot. Uh. Um, a couple weeks ago, we broke the story of a Chinese UUV. So that's factor one. Factor two is that we know there are different cultural attitudes to technology itself. So for example, in the introduction, all the science fiction was about the dangers of robots. It's kind of baked into our culture from the very word robot itself to the Terminator, et cetera. Whereas if we were in East Asia, the assumption that would be baked in from the science fiction would be robots are good. And that's also, you know, so Astro Boy versus the Terminator. And that would be the same thing in our ick factor attitudes, things that we find icky uh, a robot being used for a babysitter in East Asia, completely normal. So that's factor two. Factor three is we know there's different attitudes towards the law and international law itself, um, whereas we've talked about it as this kind of limiting tool, whereas um, I can think of two lawyers turned heads of state that might look at the law differently. So, for example, Mr. Putin has a very different definition of humanitarian intervention and kind of looking at the law as maybe a tool versus a limiting factor. And we could have a great debate about um, the Chicago train lawyer and drone wars and all that. But we've got these three factors. And I wanted to ask, how do you see them playing out on these terms that you introduced that are kind of contested within us, you know, terms like what is and isn't a robot? What is and isn't autonomous? Um, meaningful human control, automation bias. How is how are these factors coming into that? Are we are we going to see them um, take us in very different directions than the already contested environment? You know, we showed today. Yeah, I, Greg, go ahead. Briefly, and and something that uh, Heather said, and, and I'm not sure if she if she said it on purpose or it was a slip of the tongue, but, but, she, but she mentioned uh, artificial intelligence. And this goes to Pete's point, and probably I'm way out of my field at this point when you start talking about AI, right? But our automated weapon systems are not artificial intelligence. Uh, artificial intelligence, it, 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 you're talking about human qualities such as, as, as Heather said earlier, emotion, consciousness, sociability, uh, semantic understanding. These are all required for, for, for moral human decision making, okay? Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't think we're talking about artificial intelligence, but we are talking about a system that maybe sometime far in the future um, that can, can follow the law. And can help us in certain areas. It wouldn't be it wouldn't be a, a solve that cures all wounds. But there, but like like Mike's example of could you send it out to find Coney as an example? Um, maybe as Neil said, the, the difficulty in Syria that's going on. Maybe that's absolutely a place that you could not um, employ deploy mm -hmm. such weaponry. Um, so uh, you know these are all the par parts of the debate. And and I know I can't answer all your questions, Pete. But but I think the issue of what automated weapon systems is, I think it's not artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. uh, but your other points about robots, and that was a point I was making about the South Korean government. They want a robot in every home by 2020, because <laughs> it, it's viewed as, as a very positive thing. And, mm -hmm. and like you say, it has, has, uh, it's imbued with good ideas, not, not bad. Not fear. Um, so. <laughs> Um, Mike, you well, want to jump in here, and then I'm going to go to you, Heather, and then back to Neil? That's yeah, right? going back to the Geneva discussions, though, I mean, and it's, and it's subtle and it's spoken like a true international lawyer but I think that's the value of diplomatic discussions on these things we really do have very concrete discussions not in macro theory um, 
but in the specifics and the nuances of wording and of prohibitions and where's the line between prohibition and permissiveness and what are the accountability mechanisms and where are the oversight mechanisms and where are the cooperative mechanisms for international you know, consultations. You know, it's, and that, I think that's the value because absolutely, you're right, we all bring, and I say all, by different cultures. And when I said us earlier, I was referring not to the United States, but to the westernized, technologically advanced states. That's the dichotomy that I see between states that have these things that can develop them and can use them and all the non-state actors out there that, that want to and want to steal them or employ them or whatever. And that's what drives them to other forms of warfare rather than non-kinetic warfare or uh, uh, kinetic warfare. But I think that's the point of these kinds of international discussions. And, and this is where Heather, I think, would absolutely agree is we need to have these kinds of discussions very focused, not on the macro issues, is it ethical, unethical, but on the precise issues. Where's the line between ethical propriety and inappropriate extensions? And let's really have that discussion. Um, and we can have that discussion, I think, in both public settings. And I don't mean to sort of, sort of say that the only way that's done is in the context of formal negotiations. But, but we very consciously need to have those discussions in the informal diplomatic dialogue as well, and mill-to-mill -mill context. That's this the discussion that has to be had. Oh, absolutely. Um, you need a mic oh, oh, sorry, we need a mic. Can we get a mic, please? Right here, real quick. Um, the well, isn't the value one, one second, Heather. Peter wants to add. The question something. isn't the value of the discussions. I absolutely 100% agree. It's are we seeing these factors play out within these discussions? And how are we seeing them manifest themselves? Mm -hmm. So the, the value of talking is, is agreed. The question is, are we seeing these different factors play out in the discussions themselves? I think it's early yet. Mm -hmm. Heather, go right ahead. I disagree. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I disagree only because we witnessed the state discussions, at least at the CCW, you did see, so to Peter's points, right? Um, you know, there are different cultural attitudes at play about what, I mean, it, frankly, it came down on pretty similar s state lines, right? Alliances, major powers, Western, Eastern. Um, is it a Soviet satellite state that's supporting the Russian position? Um, at one point, the Chinese um, ambassador just rattled off nonsense um, for like 45 minutes. Because it was, and I say nonsense, like it was actual nonsense and like nothing made sense. And then at the end he said, and this is my personal opinion and it's not the representation of the Chinese government. And in that, in that very limited time, you see pretty much what's going on on the geopolitical side about what they view technology as, their attitudes towards that technology that they don't want to commit to say no to it. So you do see these, these tensions playing out already um, and I would also say that there are major discussions about the, pro the proliferation issue. Um, you know, there's the one side of the coin is, well, it's going to happen, so we need to have it to counterbalance um, a potential adversary. You know, we can't have a robot gap. Um, but at the same time, right, then there's the other decisions being made currently, which is, well, where are the really advanced systems being developed? Well, they're not being developed in China right now, right? I mean, the really advanced stuff is in DARPA, and it's in our, it's, we're funding it. So if you can make those types of decisions, say we're not going to do that, or we're not going to field that, I think that might be um, a helpful way to, to, to go forward. Neil. Thanks. Yeah, um, on those three, those three factors, so we're taking them in reverse order. Um, in terms of IHL, that's where, in the discussions, actually, in Geneva and... Um, and also at our own expert meeting, I saw the most coherence among states, which was really that a new weapons technology must comply with, with existing IHL. Um, there was a lot of talk about um, uh, Article 36 legal review uh, and the importance of that. You know, there was really a technology must fit the law uh, perspective, and I think um, that, was, that came through quite strongly. Um, in terms of cultural differences, I think this is uh, certainly an issue which is going to play into probably the most uh, sort of hard to pin down part of the discussion, and that's the discussion mm -hmm. about ethics. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it could go, it could influence uh, different state perspectives in different ways. I mean, perhaps um, 
as well as being more comfortable with robots, some states that are at the kind of more cutting edge of integration of robots into their society have also thought more about ethical issues around how those robots may interact with humans and so on. Um, on proliferation and wider security concerns, I think that's something that's going to uh, definitely already in the minds of states uh, in discussions, uh, international discussions in terms of uh, the potential to misuse or, and the potential accessibility to technology that could be misused or even a rudimentary robotic system that could be automated and, and misused today. Uh, so I think that's already coming through, and I think that will be, uh, I think that will be a factor um, and something that needs much more deep consideration in, uh, in discussions if they go on next year, which they probably will. Can I extend that just a little bit? Yes. Um, because the ethic question to me is not just the front end ethics of what we anticipate and what we design and, and within the boundaries of the legal construct and you know, whatever treaty language, remember a treaty or a, a, a diplomatic discussion is by definition always the suboptimal solution because it's, it's by definition what you can get the Chinese to agree to, et cetera, et cetera. Always a um, compromise. Yeah, it's always a suboptimal solution from the per per perspective of the perfect ethicist. But then you raise the second order problem, which is to say, okay, even if we agree up front, even if we've got the perfect technology and the right balance of law and ethics, as soon as you field one of these things, by definition, you now have a new modality of warfare that is capable, no question, of being hijacked. And we say misused, uh, Neil used the word misused. I think what he meant was affirmative misuse by the fielding party. But the flip side also works, mm -hmm. is that it's absolutely you know, at that point, it's just a, a new method of asymmetric warfare. If we have a billion of them out there, and somebody figures out how to take those billion things and put them into their service, boom. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think there's a real danger here that if we focus all of our thinking on this, we're, we're, we're creating a growing asymmetry, right? And because, because there's a vulnerability in these things as well. And, you know, I'm not the scientist. This is not my field. But it's absolutely possible to hijack these things to intentionally misuse them. Mm. I think we should go ahead and, and let another question in here. So please uh, go ahead. Um, yes, I'm, I'm concerned with the, uh, the problem of, of accountability. It's like um, I, I want to remind everybody that the HAL 9000 computer w was fully operational in, in the movie 2001. Uh, so, so it's like for, for these state and non-state actors that, that, that wield these autonomous weapon systems, uh, how, I mean, if, if they were to kill large numbers of civilians, I mean, how could you bring these people to justice? I mean, they, they could say, well, the, the autonomous weapon system did it. And then you, you could just say, well, well who, who uh, programmed the, these systems to make these decisions? And the, and, and the response could, could just be, well, that's classified. So, <laughs> so it's like the, the, the people could, uh, could, could use these that these weapon systems to uh, to commit atrocities and flaunt international law is this not a problem? Well, let's get some thoughts on that from our panel. Who wants to weigh in on the accountability issue? How would you how would you hold someone well, responsible? I, I think, Go I ahead. I think Mike Go addressed ahead. it a little bit earlier. Uh, as far as uh, in our construct now, it would be the same as command responsibility, right? So you're not going to hold a, a piece of tin accountable. So who programmed that piece of tin? Who, 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 who typed in the, the orders? Who gave the orders to the guy who fat fingered it into the machine? You know, you'd have to, you'd have to peel the onion and find out, uh, you know, where, where that orders went. Um, Do, I, you know, is I your opinion that it wouldn't be any harder than what we currently have, yeah, or that I it would be? be the same. It would I, be, the same be the same kind of problem. Right? I mean, I mean, as Heather as Heather said, uh, uh, you know, computers sometimes break. <laughs> so would that would that be a, a new defense at a court martial? Mm. Um, that hey, I, I I was doing everything right, but the computer broke. You know, and kind of a what are you doing, Dave? <laughs> um, so the uh, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and so um, you know, I, I think I don't think it would be any harder or any 
or any uh, less difficult than what we already have today and trying to, trying to roll up the chain to get to the accountability to see who, who should be held accountable. Um, and, and, and move beyond the E5 and below and actually roll up and find out who, who, who told them they could do this and, and uh, who, who was derelict in their duty and not supervising them in doing this. And, and that's that same discussion that we'd have in any analysis. Which again, I mean, arguably we have a broad problem sure. with this generally, sure. but, but go ahead, Neil. Yeah, I mean, I would agree that obviously you can't hold a machine to account and that has to be uh, you know, human decision making, but I think, uh, I think autonomous weapons do raise a problem in terms of potential dilution of uh, accountability and, and assessing where that accountability lies. Um, so, um, you know, if the, the human decision making that has in some way gone into uh, the, the weapons use of force, mm -hmm. you know, where is that, where is that human decision making lie? How far removed is it from in time and space from the actual uh, incident? So, for example, programmed, you know, years in advance in a laboratory. So I think there are very real problems in terms of potential dilution of the accountability, although obviously uh, accountability must lie with, uh, with humans. But well, I take it's... your point that potentially there could be uh, such a distance between when it was programmed and when it activated in a certain way. Uh, I mean, we could even imagine the original programmer's dead by the time it does something, and then what do you do? But it's an interesting Yeah, I can feel Heather jumping behind me, so I know she wants to jump in. But, but let me, let me, I, I think it's important, though, that these things don't happen in a vacuum, right? It's easy to just sort of hypothesize, yes, there's a big problem with accountability. Well, somebody made the decision to feel, knowing the existing technology, mm -hmm. somebody made the decision to send whatever piece of autonomous weapon system technology we're talking about out that decision can be reviewed and assessed both on legal and criminal grounds. And it might be possible, I think this is the intuition behind the present state of the debate where people say they want some meaningful human control. That's the intuition there. Um, but I think in the future as technology evolves, the question is how attenuated that, that becomes and what form it takes. So I don't think anybody's saying there's no accountability. The question is, in what form and for what basis, and and that's a, that's an open, it's an evolving question, just like the technology is evolving. Heather, were you bouncing to jump in on this one? Um, well, I mean, I come at this from a slightly legal and moral perspective, right? Because moral responsibility is fundamentally um, a different question than legal responsibility. I can create any law, right? I mean, the law is just somebody writing something down, and we're all agreeing to assent to that, right? Okay, so. I could say we would just create a strict liability regime. But that doesn't really get at the question I think that's the problem, which is the moral aspect of the responsibility, right? So if a programmer, there's a really great article, if you guys, if any of the gentlemen who asked the question, if you're interested in this, there's an article by Mat uh, Matthias Kaufman, and it's called The Responsibility Gap for Machine Learning. And what he says is, look, when it comes to artificially intelligent machines, and the way in which we use programming techniques to do this, there comes a point where the machine starts to learn on its own accord. And there's, a, there's no way to predict what that will be. And there's no way that the programmer made the decision to make it act that way. It's the way in which the artificial intelligent machine learned. And at that moment, right, there is no one accountable. There is no one responsible because it's, it, the machine is acting in and on the world, but it's not capable of being responsible. And the person who created it didn't create what didn't have any intentionality for the action that 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 it's taking. So the moral responsibility, I think, is actually very hard um, when it comes to thinking about who to hold it accountable. Um, and to the point before about dilution of responsibility, this is, I think, going to be a dilution of responsibility a series of iterated steps and sure we can point a finger at someone but it's is it going to be like meaningful um, the other thing that I might say suggest too is that when it comes to at least the United States policy regarding autonomous weapon systems you know the DOD issued an, a, a directive on autonomous weapon systems saying we're not going to field lethal autonomous weapon systems for a while and unless operational requirements uh, are, are needed, and three undersecretaries of defense sign off on it and say we need it. Uh, <laughs> hmm. 
it doesn't even rise to the level of the SECDEF. It doesn't rise to the level of the president. And so now you can ask questions about, well, maybe we should hold whoever is accountable for these actions. But again, I, I, then there's plausible deniability for accountability, right? So there's a whole host of questions, I think, when it comes to accountability and responsibility, legally and morally. Thank you. Now, I think we're going to try to fit in. We have at least two, maybe three questions in the queue. So what I'd like is for the next questions, if you could direct it at one of our speakers so that we can fit more in, but then that may not work and they may all want to jump in. So we'll see. Uh, go ahead, uh, Max. Yeah. Um, so maybe this question is more for uh, Heather and Neil, but um, I'm just curious, um, for those who are uh, proposing to ban uh, these weapons uh, rather than take a more sort of graduated or continuum-like approach. I'm trying to understand what is, the, what is the concern. I mean, Heather keeps referring to these as lethal weapon systems, so I'm wondering if they're non-lethal, is that okay? Um, is it high versus low tech? Is it active versus passive? Is it offensive versus defensive? I mean, Greg uh, calls up the notion of terminators, and I think that's what, all com that's what comes to most of our minds when we think of autonomous weapon systems. But we have lots of autonomous weapons that are capable of causing serious bodily harm. You mentioned landmines, but we also have junkyard dogs and razor wires. So what is the concern? I'm just trying to understand it, because this is not an area I know much about. Uh, Heather O'Neill? Um, Neil's going to go for it. Go, I'll go first. I mean, just to say, the ICRC hasn't called for a ban uh, on autonomous weapon systems. And so, really, uh, our approach at the moment is to say that these issues are exactly the issues which need to be looked at in more detail. Um, and as I said at the beginning, one of the first points is what are we talking about? And there's still much divergence between states, between different experts on that. Uh, that's the starting point. Beyond that, uh, I think the issue of human control over the use of force is, is going to be crucial. We need to look at existing systems uh, and practices and how, let's see how that informs uh, discussion about uh, the implications of technology. Yeah, I mean, so the, the, to, I think to, the, to Max's question, I think there is, um, the assumption here is that the machine can identify a target on its own and then decide to fire on that target without a human being making any sort of uh, deliberation about that target or, or pushing a button to kill that person or that target. And that's the big issue, I think, the, the issue that Neil raised initially about what we mean by a lethal autonomous weapon. Um, and it does, I think, legally it, it does change if it's defensive versus offensive, right? If you have, a, if you have like a DMZ, which if you think of North Korea and South Korea, there are already um, robots placed along the DMZ that are autonomous weapons, for this, for lack of a better word, because if if they see a, if they they it's called the Korean Dota, I believe, um, but if it if it heat seeks, it will look for a heat seeking. Um, that's how it identifies its target, and if it gets close enough, it'll fire automatically without a human being. It has an automatic mode where a human being has to like kind of check on it, and it has a fully automated autonomous mode, but I don't think that they have it flipped on, but it has that capacity. And that's already in existence. But legally, it's okay because it's on a DMZ and it's defensive. All right, uh, George, go right ahead. Maybe this is a function of our having this discussion in a law school, <laughs> but uh, it does strike me that in this tension between law and ethics, uh, that there is some sense in which we're worried about the law catching up with technology and, uh, and clarifying, in a sense, what is permissible and impermissible behavior. I'm not sure that's a good idea. Maybe I'm prejudiced because I finally left my own federal job <laughs> yesterday after you know more than two decades. I just couldn't. It wasn't because I didn't like what I did in the Department of Defense. It was because I couldn't take the stifling regulatory environment anymore. Uh, and I would hate to see one created here. I don't think, uh, for one thing, in international law, as, uh, as someone pointed out, I think it was Mike, you have to work with, with what kind of consensus you can reach. Mm. And uh, Neil, I think it was you, pointing out to us back in May that a lot of the participatory nations have no stake in this discussion at all. They were, if you're from uh, a nation in Africa, you're wondering what, what is all the fuss about automated systems and cyber war about? We don't get hacked. We have nothing to hack. Uh, and so we, we think our efforts at legislation ought to be 
put elsewhere. But if some of you people, you know, from the north, north of the equator are worried about this, you know, maybe we can, you know, share our discussions a little bit more uh, about what we ought to get the law focused on trying to do. But for us, this isn't a very big, important thing. I think the biggest distinction, and I'd like to put this to, uh, uh, to maybe to Neil and Mike in particular, is that if law is about legislation and compliance, morality is about judgment uh, and reasoning. And where have, where is the effort to be placed in terms of developing greater um, prudence, um, mature, sound judgment on the part of people in DARPA uh, or wherever you're worried about these things being, being done, engineers, uh, uh, corporations who do the, uh, uh, manage the infrastructure and build it. I would, I would prefer to be emphasizing developing a greater sort of sense of moral responsibility and judgment of a voluntary sort of soft law approach, if you will, for the law school folks. Uh, as, as having a much greater chance of addressing the concerns that we have than searching for some kind of black letter solution that would just have set new boundaries that would then be gamed and transcended by uh, clever uh, legal casuists and in any case have unintended consequences that we can't imagine right now. Mike, do you want to respond to George? Well, I was going to collect my thoughts while Neil spoke. <laughs> but, but Neil, I, will you take that? Or? But no, no, I, I do. You know, there's, 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 there's sort of the classic law school response to that is to say, yes, I agree, but, right? Um, I think the soft law approach really does work well because that presumes that we're actually talking to each other and that we're reaching some kind of genuine consensus about what we think the law should be. Um, the pushback against that from the classic international lawyer would say, yes, but that still leaves lots of room in these very difficult and, and I would say shifting moral legal judgments for people to inappropriately argue, well, this is the rule. This, in, in other words, to impose an artificial regulatory construct to use your model. And so the law does give you some sense of certainty, some sense of predictability. You know, we can talk about precisely what does distinction mean and when does it apply and you know because we've got some black letter law there that's the classic value of it but but I hear you indirectly uh, referencing something that I, I just want to make very clear at least to my mind and you know y'all can stone me if you want <laughs> but the legal and the moral and the philosophical ethical considerations are not polar opposites here um, you know, the, the law classically evolved around the idea that in the middle of armed conflict, in these very, very difficult moral situations, unconstrained conduct is not permissible. But the law, and I think the soft law, all evolved around this very careful balancing of military pragmatics. I mean, I think it's immoral, inhuman, unethical, <coughs> Uh, on every ground to say to a warfighter, we're going to put you out there, and oh, by the way, we're going to create the conditions by which you're you have no chance of doing your job, and you're losing, this is a suicide mission. That's wrong. Mm -hmm. That's why the law and the ethics all developed from the ground up to do this very, very careful balance in a permissive environment. We're empowering war fighters, but not unlimited empowerment. And that's the question. It's not that, that here's philosophy and ethics over here that values human life, and here's law that doesn't really value human life. No, I think they're, I think they're the same. And to the extent that we let this rapidly evolving field of technology evolve, we really do risk this, this, this um, divergence mm -hmm. of these fields. And that's, I think, what, what I want to see, is that we're conscious about creating some symmetry here. A uh, quick comment from Neil, and then I'm going to try to sneak in one last question. Yeah, just quickly, I mean, there is a strong link uh, between international law and ethics um, through the Martins Clause, which requires and is recognized as something which new weapons should be judged against, and that is, do they comply with the principles of humanity and the dictates of public conscience, which, of course, you know, isn't something which you clearly have in mind exactly what that is, but there is, that's exactly why it links directly to the ethical question. Um, and I think that's something that is going to need to be discussed on this issue at the international level. Um, of course, individual ethical responsibilities of scientists working on different scientific areas are also important and have been important in, in other areas where, of sort of technology and weapons issues. Um, but I think the two are sort of separate but related issues. 
Last so question in the back. Um, I'm George, so sorry. Uh, that, sorry, I just wanted to say, George, there are actually some companies now for going um, and publicly declaring that they won't make uh, any autonomous weapons in the future. So, so some sorry. have taken a corporate stance against it? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Final question in the I back. Would I would remark that there's a United States Supreme Court case that addresses a very closely analogous issue, United States versus Yamashita. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in which the Supreme Court upheld seven to two, uh, the death verdict against General Yamashita, uh, mm -hmm. whose defense was that he'd been unable to control his subordinates. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so there, there is legal precedent actually mm -hmm. from our Supreme Court, mm -hmm. uh, whether it needs to be revisited or not, uh, two justices dissented uh, mm -hmm. with uh, the war ba uh, barely over but that president is out there, and I, I think that the Homa case went to the Supreme Court too. So the point uh, on the accountability issue uh, there, if we were looking at that as a precedent, would be to say that uh, uh, we do have a, at least one standard there domestically of holding people accountable, even though they would argue they no longer had control. It would be the same. Yeah, yeah it would be the, the same. same. Argument. Absolutely. All right, uh, we, <laughs> we have run down our clock. I'm gonna let each of our panelists um, do me a quick little, if you have a 30 second final comment of, of if you want them to remember one thing uh, about our remarks here. Um, Greg, I'm gonna have you yeah, go first. Yeah, I'm just gonna say now's the time to begin thinking about uh, our, our built-in ethical constraints that, mm -hmm. that, that, that will be needed. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think increasing reliance on autonomous weapon systems are, are gonna mm -hmm. undermine our humanity. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I don't think that robots are going to enslave or exterminate humanity. Um, I, I think we've always adapted to our technology, and I think the benefits will outweigh the cost. Heather. Um, I would probably just close with the fact that ethics is necessarily about action guiding principles. And when we say something is moral or ethical or the right thing to do, it's a decision that is based in a voluntary, autonomous human being that can make that decision. And so I, I worry that um, the idea that you can program ethics is actually slightly um, incoherent because you can't program something, um, then it's just a dictate. It's not actually a, a fully chosen moral action. Um, and so I think that looking at kind of Arkin's decisions to program machines is a slightly pernicious and it's also a little bit short-sighted about what ethics is and what it means to be ethical. So we need to be very careful of thinking that we can do that with machines too. Mike. Well, I'm going back to the idea because I've worked in those in that jungle of the dense regulatory bureaucracy of our own Department of Defense and by extension our own governments and our and our Western coalitions. I guess philosophically and temperamentally, um, I don't know about you all, but speaking for myself, I get very, very tired of letting events drive our responses. <laughs> you know, let, we're, we're reactive, and this is an area where this is not catching us by surprise. <laughs> Right? We have been talking about this concept and this model for a very long time. And I guess what I'd like to say is, let's be very conscious about how we design, what values we want to serve, what values we want to preserve, how we best balance changing technology with ethical decisions. And maybe Heather's right. We decide that the right ethical rule is that there's no way technologically to do this. Fine, but what does that mean? And I guess what I'd like to say is we'd be very focused about the societal values we want to preserve, which is minimizing, uh, minimizing the, the harm to non-combatants, minimizing damage to civilian structures, but yet at the very same time enhancing war fighting and my personal one, which I didn't get time to talk about, enhancing deterrence. You know, we really do want to enhance deterrence in an asymmetric world on all fronts. Those are the, the societal values. Let's be proactive. Let's design technology against a known benchmark. And we may not be able to get there, but you know, I put up in slide in, in class the classic slide: "You'll never get where you're going unless you know where you're going." Right? <laughs> you know, let's be proactive about the values societally and internationally that we want to serve, and let's see if technology can get us there. In the end, maybe not, but but I think we ought to at least try to get ahead of this rather than simply being driven by responses. And Neil. 
Yeah, I would just say uh, that it's important to, to not make assumptions about technology, what it's capable of, what it might be able to do. We really need to, in this discussion in particular, wed uh, the capabilities of technology and robotics and how that technology is being used in weapon systems that are developing today. Uh, we need to wed that to our legal and our ethical analysis uh, if we're to come to solutions and policy, uh, policy outputs that are going to be relevant. Wonderful. Uh, can we thank our panelists, please? Thank you, thank you, Shannon, as well. Before we break for the break, um, I just had mentioned during my welcome uh, the wonderful and, and special role that the Wolf Family Foundation plays in funding this conference and making it possible. And I see that Jim Wolf has joined us, and I just wanted to bring him to your attention. I'm sure he disembarrasses him, but. All right, so we'll reconvene in 15 minutes. Yes. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Heather. Thanks for doing that. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Have to talk further at some other time. Great job, guys. I really enjoyed that. What a great conversation. Thank <laughs> you.